Suppose you have a great location to display a giant mathematical cardboard sculpture. But you don't actually have a giant mathematical cardboard sculpture. What are you going to do? You should make one. This video shows you all the steps for you to make your own giant geometric construction. I've been having fun showing groups of students how to make large mathematical structures from cardboard. It's a great group project to cut out the parts, figure out how they go together, glue them, clamp them, and watch the structure grow as components are added. The key to doing this efficiently and safely is a scroll saw, which can easily cut through a one inch thick stack of cardboard. This is my latest in a series of similar assembly events, and I think it's a pretty cool activity. The one we're building today is an impressive two meters in diameter. I've been developing the techniques so anyone can make something similar. Each construction starts with a design concept. Part of the concept here is that there are 60 identical flat parts arranged with icosahedral symmetry. It'll be quite solid because there's a great deal of triangulation within the structure. I usually make a paper prototype first to be sure I like the design and to help me figure out the best strategy for assembling it at full scale. I've been evolving this design somewhat for each event as you can see from this series of paper models. In this latest version, there are 20 hollow spherical features positioned like the vertices of a regular dodecahedron. Each spherical space is outlined by three flat pieces lying in three mutually orthogonal planes. I like the way this suggests an XYZ coordinate system around each sphere, but we'll see that they're not oriented all the same way. After I work out a design, the actual construction begins with a full-size template for the part shape. This one fits nicely on a 16 by 32 inch rectangle. I first print it on paper at full scale and then trace that onto cardboard to cut out the master template. Four lines are for folding small flaps and three are for alignment when assembling. Notice these small notches that mark the ends of the seven lines. So to make this design, you can just start with this template. There's a full scale PDF version on my georgehart.com website. We're using a scroll saw to cut the cardboard. It's a fairly safe tool, much safer than cutting with knives, and I've never heard of a major accident with one. But still, be sure you know how to use it. Our first step is to divide the cardboard sheets in half. I ordered 32 inch square sheets of corrugated cardboard, so we're making 16 by 32 rectangles. Cut with the grain, so the corrugation goes the long way, and the parts will be more resistant to folding. Carefully trace your master template onto a sheet of cardboard with a marker. While one person traces it, others can hold the template down to keep it from moving. Be sure to get the little notches in the edge of the template, which will later be used to locate the fold lines and connection points. We're working with stacks of six pieces of cardboard at a time, held together with big black binder clamps. So to make the necessary 60 parts, we'll need 10 of these stacks altogether. Cutting is the most time consuming step. Just follow the lines and be sure to make a small notch, just deep enough to see, wherever the template has a notch. I have a spiral blade in the scroll saw, which means it has teeth in all directions, so you can cut in any direction. This is plain brown corrugated cardboard, but it would be easy to use colored sheets or to paint the cut parts for a more vibrant result. There are several nice ways you could then multicolor the final result in a symmetric manner. The cutting took several hours, so everyone could take turns doing some cuts while others were working in parallel on the preparation and assembly. Four flaps need to be folded on the ends of each part. Later, these will be used for gluing the parts together. Using a straight edge aligned with the notches makes it easy to get a crisp fold in exactly the right place. The three notches away from the ends are not for folding. They're just to indicate where another piece glues onto this piece. The basic module consists of three parts that join to surround one of the spherical spaces. They lie in three mutually orthogonal planes and form something of a comet shape with three-fold symmetry and a spiraling tail. It's important that all the modules have the same handedness. First, just clamp them together without glue, check that everything is positioned properly, notch to notch, and then glue it. When the glue dries, we can take off the clamps and put five modules together around a five-fold axis. We should first clamp the modules together without glue to see how everything fits. When it looks right, take off the clamps one at a time, brush glue in the flap, and reclamp it. 
We held the parts in the air to start, because it's best to see it from the outside when comparing to the computer animation or that paper model. But now the first five modules can sit on the floor, giving us a base to add to. We're using a convention that the handles of the clamp are in one position before gluing and in another position after gluing, so you can easily see which joints still need glue. When you've seen the pattern of what connects to what, you can then add another five modules. Again, clamp first, and when you're sure everything is correct, unclamp one joint at a time to brush on a thin layer of glue. The clamps can stay in place for a while while the glue dries. And while some people are assembling, others are working at the same time on cutting more pieces. I encourage people to swap roles occasionally so everyone gets some experience on each aspect of the process. Once you understand the pattern, it's a nice puzzle to figure out where new modules go. At this point, I can step back and just watch everyone working together to figure it all out. While there's constant progress, it still takes longer than you may think to get it all assembled. There are 240 joints altogether that need gluing. But it's nice that you can work all around it on different sides at once, so many people are constantly involved in the process. In total, it took about three hours to get all 60 components cut, assembled, and glue. So don't think of this as a quick project. Even if you had pre-cut all the parts before the assembly event, it still takes a while to figure out how they go together to make the connections and for the glue to dry. I should mention that although we use new cardboard that was ordered online and shipped to the site, you can make this from old boxes and that would add a nice recycling aspect to the project. After the glue had a chance to dry, we tied string for hanging it and took off all the remaining clamps. It looks pretty cool, and it's fun to rotate it and watch all the different parts spinning by. Try to figure out how the XYZ planes around each spherical opening relate to the planes around the other openings. By the way, this is taking place at the Canada-USA Math Camp at Colby College in Waterville, Maine in July 2013. I like the way they incorporated aspects of the sculpture into this year's Math Camp t-shirt. I love leading mathematical sculpture barn raisings like this. People often ask me to make large sculptures for their school or university, but stronger materials like metal or wood can be very expensive. But I've discovered that cardboard is quite affordable and suitable for making these large cool constructions. If designed and built carefully, they can last for years. So I hope this video inspires you to create something wonderful.